After dealing with the continent, let's deal with English Baroque furniture. Now, in England, the use of veneers was common, with emphasis on the grain of the wood, which is commonly why one uses the veneers in the first place. Inlay was used rarely, but was used, and gilding will be used only sparingly. English Baroque furniture had lighter, more delicate framing members than Jacobean forms. Aprons, seat rails, stretchers, and bottom rails of case furniture were shaped oftentimes with a C-scroll, replacing turning as the primary decorative element. Foliated casings, uh, foliated carvings in deep relief, and on arched crest rails and front stretchers replace the shallow carving that we see in the Jacobine. So we see something becoming far more sculptural. And we're going to see a lot of outside influence here. Obviously, they're going to be influenced by Flemish workmen. They're going to be influenced by the French and the Italians and so many other ideas coming in at the time. Now, the woods that they're using are primarily going to be maple and walnut, things that are available to them. These are hardwoods, really good for furniture. They're not going to chip up and be damaged very easily. Although we will start to see the import of mahogany. Uh, now, mahogany had greater strength than walnut, making it possible to make more slender and delicate supports that required no stretchers. Because it's easily carved, we would also see finely detailed ornament. So, this will become more and more common as we move forward. So let's start with restoration furniture. And this is the transitional period between the Jacobean and the William and Mary style. So this is all tied to the restoration of the monarch, Charles II following Oliver Cromwell, hence the restoration period. So this comes from the crowning of Charles II. Uh, there had been a lot of problems in England, and obviously during times of civil strife, we don't see a lot of new forms, either in art, architecture, or in this case, in furniture. But we will start to see new ideas. For example, the restoration chair. Now, it had a tall raking back and oftentimes spiraled uprights running up from our armrest. The use of the spiral is really common during this period, and it's a very difficult but very decorative form. Flemish influence could also be seen in the carved scrolls that acted as a crest rail. The front legs had either a turned or carved stretcher to them. In this case, we have a carved stretcher running across the front. And we see oftentimes cane seats, although in this case, this is an upholstered seat. Now, as you can see, we're going to a more decorative form. It is lighter. Obviously, you can imagine just picking it up. When I refer to some piece of furniture as being lighter, you can imagine it that way. The elements don't seem heavy and overwhelming as we've seen elsewhere, uh, more especially as we saw it during the Tudor period. So we're getting something in the restoration that is lighter, but it's building that pomp and circumstance of the Baroque, which of course makes sense with the restoration of the monarchy. We also see the banister back chair, and in this case, what we see is a chair with four or five split uh, balusters that supported a crest rail. Now these are made like split spindle. Each was flat on the front and rounded on the back. And this really makes it the banister back chair. Uh, we often will see a cane seat and a seat that will be narrower at the back than at the front. This, of course, makes sense because most people sit in a chair. You don't hold your legs together. You let them spread a little bit. Now, oftentimes, they will use some kind of woven basket weave pattern for the seat. Oftentimes, this is called splint, which was a vegetative product that was more coarse than rush, but less expensive. In later fashion, in the form of the uh, 
sorry, the front legs will later take on different forms, more decorative forms. But you can imagine that this chair, this example, is a little lower market version. We're not seeing all of the Flemish scroll work and everything else that we would expect of the same period. So let's talk about William and Mary furniture. The English Baroque style of furniture was named for the reign of William of Orange and Mary II. William was the Dutch husband of Mary II. They became co-rulers. There's a whole mess there. It's basically a coup or a civil... You can look at a number of different ways. Uh, but they bring with them numerous Flemish and Dutch craftsmen and a predisposition for the designs of France and the Low Countries. So the William and Mary style is very common, very popular from 1700 to 1725 and the United States, or sorry, in the Americas until it's about 735, 1735. The Americas tend to be a little bit behind in part because of that whacking great ocean in between. It was largely supplanted by Queen Anne style and then by Chippendale, but we'll get there later. So there are a few things that we're going to see in William and Mary. For example, the trumpet leg. Now, the trumpet leg plays a role with other forms. But basically, what we have is a leg that starts at a very narrow point and expands as it moves up, just like the bell of a trumpet. We will also see the inverted cup leg. And this is often at the top. So here we have a trumpet leg underneath with an inverted cup leg. And you can see that cup here. Uh, that I've highlighted. So here's the drinking edge, here's the uh, stem, here's the base uh, flipped over. And it looks very similar to that uh, cup and cover that we saw from Elizabethan England. We will also see the spoon back chair. Now, the spoon back obviously can take on a number of different forms, but generally we're going to see something with a uh, curved form to the back and this is something we haven't seen much of in the past it makes it a more comfortable chair it more accurately depicts the curvature of the human spine uh, so we have vertical compound curves similar to that of a spoon and we see elaborately carved crest rails and a carved center splat that uh, extends from the crest rail to the stay rail near the seat the chair seats are typically wider in the front, again, than they are in the back. Now, we also have storage and desks, and this is where we're going to get some forms that we see a lot of today, such as the high boy. Now, the high boy is basically a piece with a series of drawers set up on a series of legs of some form, and that's what you're seeing here. Uh, so we have a chest of drawers, usually on some short legs. And that's basically what gives us the high boy, if it's all drawers. And here we can see the trumpet, the inverted cup uh, in the legs, which are so common to this period. They will also have another form, which is the tall boy. Now, the tall boy holds a little bit more and tends to have doors on the upper side or the upper piece. The upper piece also usually sits slightly inset from the base. So you see we've got a little bit of space, this very deep uh, cornice here, or very deep molding between the base and the upper unit. This would open and have a series of smaller drawers. These are, again, very common storage elements. And these are the sorts of things that aren't necessarily in the bedroom. These might be out in the living quarters. And you're showing these pieces off. You're going to use a lot of uh, veneers and other forms on them. The fixtures are commonly very, very important. Now, in the English form of the Baroque, because they're a Protestant nation, we see something that is far simpler, especially in the tall boy and high boy, than what we saw on the continent. You see the form is there, but the decorative elements, the ornamentation, just doesn't follow on. Then we see the slant front desk, and this is a form that we see very commonly even on the antique market today. And this is a William and Mary innovation. I mean, not that they did it, but from the period where we see a sloping front that could be lowered to create a writing surface. Typically, you have these little pieces here that pull out and serve as a support for this desk when it opens. 
You'll have drawers on the outside. The top, the slant will lock because, of course, this is taking on the form of that uh, slope or Bible box that we dealt with in the Renaissance, except now it's on legs with drawers. And inside, you usually have a series of pigeonholes and drawers to maintain your materials and store things in a very safe way, assuming no one takes the entire desk uh, out of your place. Now, this, of course, expands further. If I take that slant front and I put a cabinet on top of it, now suddenly I have a secretary. And this is another form that until the end of the 19th century and really the middle of the 20th century was fairly common. We have the same form, large drawers underneath, your large writing surface, your pigeonholes, and then drawers and pigeonholes used here. The whole thing would lock up, so these doors typically lock as well as the slant front that goes with it. Now, the lower section is basically a desk. And the top was this massive piece of storage. Now, this sort of thing would be necessary if you are a merchant, if you're in the upper middle class running a factory or something along those lines. We also see beds of the period, specifically the day bed. And this looks a lot like the Jacobean bed that we talked about. The difference is we start to see more and more stretchers put into place and there's no recline to the one surface that we have. So you could sit up with your legs out. You could in theory lay down, but generally people wouldn't. And really it comes down to construction. When we look at this, all of these turn details, the bun feet, uh, these forms suggest William and Mary in this case, rather than Jacobine. It's uh, just a little too light, especially in the stretchers for the Jacobine. 